Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshanathan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel Love Marriage. And I'm Whitney Terrell, author of the novel The Good Lieutenant. And this week, we're focusing on an issue that has been overshadowed in the news given um, other recent events, but it's actually the 20th anniversary of the U.S. opening the Guantanamo Bay prison, which was... I think really kind of a pivotal moment when America's war on terror took a turn toward what many people have called violations. Yes, toward what many people have called violations of the Geneva Convention. And to be clear, when I say many people, I am one of the many people. Yeah, Um, me too. Yeah. It's easy to forget about this. And I think right now, you know, we're looking, we're we're feeling as Americans very righteous. we're on the we are on the side of good and democracy by supporting Ukraine, except for of course uh, Tucker Carlson and the former president who are supporting Putin, um, and that is important. But I do feel like it's important for when we talk about Putin and and putting people in prison without charges and torturing them, and we're looking down on him for doing that. We need to remember that we did this, and we are doing it still today. That's why we've invited Mansour Adethi to talk with us today. Mansour was held at Guantanamo Bay Prison for over 14 years without charges, having been released in 2016. Since gaining his freedom, he has won the Richard J. Margolis Award for Nonfiction Writers of Social Justice Journalism. He's also a project coordinator for CAGE, an organization that aims to empower communities impacted by the war on terror. His memoir, Don't Forget Us Here, Lost and Found at Guantanamo, was released in August 2021. Mansoor, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me today. The first thing that uh, I want to do as an American citizen is apologize to you. Uh, It's not enough, but I want to start there. Uh, What happened to you and what you recount in unforgettable detail in your book was wrong and diabolical. And I opposed the government about that war and, and, the, and the creation of that base. But I opposed almost everything the government was doing at that time, but it's not enough uh, just to oppose. And I'm still res- as responsible for that, what that ha- for what happened as all Americans are. So I wish I could have done more to stop it. You know what, neither is many people who always were like, we are sorry or apologizing. I mean, we don't hold you know, account to for what happened to us, except from those who are responsible for what happened to us. So, and I don't think George W. Bush and his uh, gangs stand or speak behalf on all Americans. Uh, yeah, that's it. So you have nothing to apologize about. So we understand, you know, those people, you know, acting, I don't think like based on their American values or principles. Monster, you have a very beautiful passage early in the book about your life in Yemen before you were kidnapped as, as you term it by the US government. And I particularly love the way that you described going to the city of Sana'a and seeing houses with electric lights for the first time. And and I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that time in your life. Yeah, it was one of the beautiful moments in my life, moving from a small village where, you know, rural area, rural, uh, uh, you know, like separate areas from the city is far away. No electricity, no basic uh, surface there. Uh, it was my first time to go to the city. The first time to see too much buildings, uh, lights, streets, a lot of cars, people. It was, you know, it was really another world for me. So it was so beautiful. It's been like the first week just walking around, just enjoying the scenery, talking to people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, because we, uh, I lived a really... Uh, you know, tribal uh, area where there is no any kind of like basic uh, surface like uh, water or electricity or anything. So, and also small village. When you move to that city, see, especially at night, see these slides, people, cars, you know, I never imagined that in my life. Just, it had been all of a sudden, second, uh, sudden, so yeah. I'm going to read a passage from the book. Um, we like to have people read and you asked if we would read it. So I'm going to go right ahead and read a passage because I think it's very beautifully written and I want the audience to be able to hear it. So this is from early on in the book describing this time that you're just talking about now. I remember my first day of school and being so afraid. I'd never been in the neighboring village and couldn't believe how big it was and how many people were there. 
it wasn't that much bigger than our village, but to me, it was a different world. The school was just a small room with dirt floors beside the mosque where every teacher had a stick to smack unruly kids. The first day I went, I was told to line up by the door before going to class, and the teacher hit me on the hand when I didn't. I told him I wouldn't line up if he was going to strike me like that, and he hit me again. I picked up a rock to throw it at him, and my brother came running and told me I couldn't talk back to the teacher like that. I didn't understand why, but when I but but I did what my brother told me to do, and my, when my father found out, he taught me the meaning of respect without using a single word, a lesson I never forgot. I ran with a pack of boys my age at school, just like our tribe. Um, and we always played with the other pack with other packs of boys. We chased each other and fought when we could, as boys do. I was head of my pack, and the rules were simple. What I thought my father might have come up with: no cursing, no snitching, no bleeding. I remember one day when we were playing, and one of my friends yelled at me to stop a boy from another pack from running away. I picked up a rock. I was always picking up rocks, and I threw it at him. I was a good shot, and I hit him in the head and stopped him cold. But I also made him bleed. I refused to tell on my friend. I got in so much trouble for not telling, and finally the other boy came forward and told the story. My mother was so mad at me and disappointed and ashamed. She didn't talk to me for days. I'll never forget that. It broke my heart, and I never wanted to dis disappoint her again. Can you tell me how to say the name of the town? Is it Rema? Yes, Rema. Okay. Rema was my whole world until I left home at 13 to live with my aunt in Sana'a, the capital, the only place I could finish my secondary education. It was my first time going to Sanaa and also my first car ride. I got so sick to my stomach. It was nighttime when we came over the last mountain before getting to Sanaa. The lights flickering down in the dark valley was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. My brother had accompanied me and explained what I was seeing. These are all lights and houses and stores and streets, he said. They're all run by electricity. I couldn't believe my eyes as we drove down the wide boulevards to the center of the city. What life? My aunt and my cousin who was about the same age as me, picked us up and took us to, the re to a restaurant. But I was too busy taking in everything in to eat, the bright signs in storefronts, all the people in cars, traffic lights, and the noise of the city. It made my entire body hum with excitement. I wanted to stay out all night and see everything, but my cousin was bored by it all. This was just his everyday life. There was so much to do and see and learn, and it felt like there wasn't enough time in life to do it all. I had never seen so many crazy buildings in one place. I'd always been curious in those first days, I walked into buildings all over the city and asked shopkeepers, attendants, anyone who was there, what they did and what kind of business they had. My cousin was so embarrassed and teased me for talking to anyone who would listen. But this was how I learned every inch of our neighborhood. It's mostly forgotten now. I remember that my life in Sanaa was uh, full of firsts. I watched TV for the first time and fell in love with the crazy bird called Woody Woodpecker. I used the telephone for the first time to call my father's restaurant in Saudi Arabia and tell him I got top marks in my classes. His voice was weaker than in person, but still strong despite the distance. I loved electricity. I loved that you could turn a light on and off and not have to light a lamp. I couldn't wait to go home and tell my younger brothers and sisters about everything I'd experienced. You can't know what that feels like if you've never lived without it. My world was growing and I wanted more. Not long after this passage in the book, and in multiple places in the book, you refer to detain certain detainees as having been sold to the CIA and ending up in Guantanamo. What was this process? How did it work? And is that what happened to you not long after this? You know, uh, Guantanamo is a different uh, place. It's not just different because it's different, because the way it was created, the way it was established, and most people who end up in Guantanamo were either sold for bounty money or were mistaken identity. That is also a report for ACLU and uh, Satan, Hill, uh, Satan Hall University uh, report about uh, Guantanamo. After 9-11, after when American arrived in Afghanistan, the airplane were, through, were throwing uh, 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 pamphlet, uh, uh, you know, offering uh, a lot of bounty of money. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so anyone who sold or uh, brought Arabs or foreigners in Afghanistan will be rewarded for thousands or tenth of thousands of dollars. The, in my first case, we were ambushed by one of the world lords while, while in our uh, trip to uh, Kunduz city to deliver some kind of logistic stuff for one of the hospitals. 
Then I was sold to the second Lord, then sold to the CIA. When I arrived in Afghanistan, they were right around 800 men or 780 men exactly. And, you know, age, but the youngest detainee was only a few months old. The oldest was 105 years old. And as you know, as according to a CLU that 86%, as we said, either sold for bounty money or were mistaken uh, identity, like in my case. I, Suki, I, I mean, I don't know how it was for you reading this, but that part is the is one of the most troubling things that 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 the CIA was accepting this right as a way of getting prisoners because they just wanted people to be in prison. It seemed like to me, like they must have known. You know, it, it, you know, like when we when we talked to them and later on, they said the operation was uh, at Guantanamo <clears throat> after two thousand ten when talking to the Americans official in Guantanamo. They say, you know, the Guantanamo, it, it shouldn't uh, stay that long. It was it was created as a place to bring everyone there and to, you know, to go through the, the, the to uh, to go through the files and the people there and to to identify who is Al Qaeda, who is Taliban, who is not, and to send people back. This this is in their in their uh, narrative. But when we arrived there, the fact is, when we arrived there, they have no any kind of information or names or photos nothing about us. So when we were being interrogated there, it wasn't, it wasn't about to find who you are. It wasn't just to prove that you are someone you are not. They tried to, the interrogator were looking for people. We, we weren't that people basically. So it, the idea is when I met the first time one of the CIA uh, at Guantanamo, when he tried to recruit me, he said, what, what I'm going to tell the, uh, the White House, the Congress, we brought innocent people to this place. Where is Al-Qaeda? Where is Allahu Akbar? Where is Osama bin Laden? I said, it's not my job. And you know, I have nothing to do with that. He said, literally, he told me, there, there are always victims of uh, war. Consider yourself one of them. And this is one of the things that hurt me most at Guantanamo, knowing someone who knew, uh, knows that I'm an innocent, but he doesn't care. It doesn't matter. So at Guantanamo, we were serving as, you know, putting us in this kind of like orange jumpsuit. And I used to tell the guards, we are actually working for the US government. It's like, whether we like it or not, we work as detainees because they want to tell their people and to the world, we brought the worst of the worst here. Because when the guard left us with years and years, uh, with months and months, they found out you're not that bad guys. I said, ask your government. Uh, it seems like there's, in some ways, what you're describing about the um, the process of being sold and the incentivizing of turning in innocent people to to incentivize turning people in um, to put bounties on that. I mean, in some ways, that's a outside the world of the the prison. That's like a pre a precursor to things like torture, right? Which is, of course, um, you know, so ethically compromising, and then also, right, it produces a dishonest result as well. Um, and so it seems to me like those things are, it's like a whole chain of actions like that. And so you are kidnapped, beaten, chained, you're flown to Guantanamo Bay prison. And then when you arrive, you don't, you don't know that you don't know what's going on where you are. Um, but now you are very well versed in the history of Guantanamo. So for our listeners who have been avoiding this history, could you talk a little bit about how um, Guantanamo Bay detention camp was started and why it was opened? You know, I know, as we all know about 9-11, you know, and the, the invasion of Afghanistan, <coughs> they established first prison, uh, prison in Afghanistan. Also, the black sites, which also was way worse than uh, Guantanamo. I spent over two months in one of the black sites. And trust me, one day in the black site, worse than 15 years at Guantanamo. Because, you know, they, they there was no limit whatsoever to what they can do to, to, to you at the black side. Many people lost their life. And as you know, the, the CIA destroyed all the evidence, all the materials that were about the black side. Guantanamo was created outside of the, of the uh, uh, justice system, outside of the law until that place. Got Guantanamo, uh, American constitution doesn't apply. Uh, Geneva Confession doesn't apply. Uh, international law doesn't apply at that place. You have no rights until that day. We are talking about 20 years of torture, 20 years of injustice, 20 years of torture. This is what Guantanamo stands for, stand for torture. 
you know, uh, injustice, oppression, lawlessness, abuse of power. And those people, you know, but when we fight for, for the closure of Guantanamo, we are actually fighting for the American justice system that has been abused and misused until that day. We're not talking about justice. Have, have the uh, families of 9-11, have they seen any justice? No, no. And I mean, those, the, this is what Guantanamo, as they claim that created for, you know, just for, for, to imprison the terrorists of the worst of the worst. And I am talking to the, some of the families of 9-11, they haven't seen any justice. When I, some of the family of the 9-11 victims, they have died, they haven't seen any justice because simply Guantanamo is a mistake. Guantanamo is, I think, one of the worst places in earth created by the United States and it still supplies and encourage other uh, tyrant around the world to create such, such places. It can it gives some kind of legitimacy, torture, injustice, oppression, and lawlessness. And it has been used against the United States, whether from Al Qaeda or other groups or by even by the Russian uh, when they criticize the United States, they look, look what you're doing, Guantanamo. So I think that's very important. And right now we're talking all about how you know we all support Ukraine and we hate what the Russians are doing and they're they're attacking civilians and they are being authoritarian and they're they're possibly using torture but it is really important for American citizens especially now marking the 20th anniversary of this prison to pay attention to what we did here and that's why I also think like when you're saying like there we say there were beatings these things those are abstract terms but the descriptions in your book need to be read People listening to this podcast need to read them so that they can feel and understand really the depth of depravity that was happening in these black sites and at Guantanamo. You know, it's not Guantanamo, it's not about just beating them. No, Guantanamo was there is systematic torture, and Guantanamo actually uh, was turned into what they call a developing enhanced interrogation technique that started by uh, the end of 2002 when General Jeffrey Miller arrived at that time. and. If you go and I check who is G, uh, General Jeffrey Miller, when he finished at Guantanamo, he was sent to uh, Iraq, where the, he tortured uh, prisoners in Abu Ghraib and other places. Basically, they started constructing interrogation uh, technique or torture technique at Guantanamo. Guantanamo, if you just Google Guantanamo America's Battle Lab, it is a report by CTN Hall uh, University. You can find how Guantanamo turned into be an experimenting lab for interrogators, supervised by psychologists, and, and so on. This is the truth of Guantanamo. We are talking about 20 years indefinite detention. I didn't think that had been ever in the United States history that men detained for 20 years without trial, without trial, without charge. You know, at Guantanamo, we were accused that we were, they accused us that they 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 used to tell us, you want to destroy our our, uh, our that you that you accuse us that you want to destroy. I mean, what's stronger than, than this? You, they accuse us to destroy that. It's like, we have nothing against you, but they want to feel that they are, they are fighting. You know, There was no one to fight, but the, even the soldiers, when they were before they sent to Guantanamo, they were told, you know, you are going to meet the worst of the worst terrorists, the one who is uh, responsible for 9-11. But when those soldiers arrived and spent uh, with us for a few months, you know, the fact, the reality contradict what the, the, their leadership told them. And many of them started like quarreling with us. Many of them actually become victims of Guantanamo itself because when they tried to preserve their humanity or refuse to take orders torturing people, they were punished. They were also uh, pay price. Guantanamo, it was a test for humans. I'm not saying just we were as detainees were victims. So guards and camp staff, they're also victims of, of, of uh, Guantanamo. I wonder if you could talk specifically about the prison's leadership. You, you write, and I'm, I'm quoting here, the Americans seemed at odds with each other over the question of who we were. Were we animals and monsters or were we humans and how should we be treated? Um, and that's the end of the quote. When you arrived, the two men in charge of the prison were General Bacchus and General Dunleavy, um, who seemed to exemplify that particular split that you described there. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, and we, when we arrived at Guantanamo, like Guantanamo, it's not like any other prison where there is like a systematic uh, um, uh, prison system where the people define how we treated, riots, and so on. And this is one of them 
one of the main arguments with the, with the camp leadership at Guantanamo over and over and over again. They, when they compare us to the United States prisoners, they said, you guys have a lot, especially after 2010, when we get like a little freedom, the army weren't happy about it. And I remember one of the, one of the in 2012, when the army came, they said, your guys have more right than the prisoners in the United States. I said, excuse me, you're talking about prisoners. I mean, here, what kind of rights we have? You like they when they saw us like have TV, we have like 20, 20 hour of freedom. It, it started to, 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 in 2010, by the way. So I told them, you are talking about people who have rights, people who have been tried, charged, and they serve time. But here, I have been here for 10 years, 11 years. Can you tell me why I'm here in the first place? What I have done? Can you put me before your justice system? They said, it's not my job. You know, you are talking about with the, with the you know, especially when we took the military uh, leaders or soldiers, they are trained to be killers. They're not trained to be like treat you as a human. They're not trained to treat you as like, uh, no, they just, or their concern security issues, try that you do, that the Chinese uh, don't escape, they're trying to cause any problems. So when we arrived the first at Guantanamo, there was also conflict between the integrators groups because you have the CI, you have the FBI, you have the MI, military intelligence, you have different, you have NSA, you have diff different uh, agencies. And each one wanted, wanted, to, wanted to treat us differently. Even two generals, one of them believed that Geneva Convention sh should apply and should be treated as, you know, more prisoners. The other one, no, they should be, they should be treated like criminals and they should be subjected uh, to uh, torture and extracting information. We could see that from the beginning. And if, when you cut between those two sides, I mean, there was, I mean, as before was, I was so young and I couldn't understand what was going on. All I see like, this is so wrong. What happened is wrong because I have done nothing wrong. And I tried to find why I was there until when was going to happen to me. And, Every time new interrogation, every time new leadership, every time new administration, they treat, they start to treat you according to their view. Everyone have their own mission and vision how to run the camps. And when General Jeffrey Moore arrived, he actually created what they call GTF, Guantanamo Joint Task Force, where everything should work toward achieving the, uh, the extracting valuable information from prisoners. And now, every, inter every, every uh, team of interrogation arrives, they will start with us from zero. Actually, what's your name? What's your case? Why were there? And they have their own uh, techniques for interrogation. They call it enhanced interrogation techniques, like beating, sleeping, uh, sleep deprivation, raving, uh, uh, you name it. There is no end. And like, there is some people who also, they, they also created black site within Guantanamo. Guantanamo itself is a black site, but there are also black sites where people were also uh, waterboarded and uh, tortured worse. I, one of the things that I, was remarkable to me about the book is like that you and your other, the, your fellow detainees um, keep trying to figure out the rules. They're like, look, we want to follow the rules. Could you just tell us what the rules are, right? And they keep changing all the time. There's one really moving scene where there's this guy who's like, you had only a certain amount of time to shower and everyone would like practice on getting the showering done in that certain amount of time, right? And they were going to be told 10 minutes before it was over so they could wash off. And one of the other detainees, like the, guy, the guard decides not to tell him when 10 minutes is, what when he has, when he has 10 seconds left. Right. And he ends up covered with soap. And the guard's like, all right, you got to go back covered with soap. We don't care. And, and he's like, just tell me what the rules are. You know, I, I, that must have been incredibly difficult mentally to deal with. Yeah. I mean, you know, even the guards found it really hard to catch up with the rules because in average two weeks, the rules, the SOP would like call a standard operation procedure. It changed every, every, every once every two weeks. So imagine for 15, 14 years, 15 years, around like 84 times. And every week you can like, there is new rules about everything basically because everything is about control at Guantanamo, everything. Your sleep, your, uh, even the air, the talk, everything is about control. So with each shift, they have their own rules. They have their own, you know, they have like each shift, they have run things, run things differently. For example, one of the shifts, they serve you the meal uh, normally, you can get your meal at, at, that, at this time. Second shift, they give you the meal in two or three hours. They will give you the first, the cup of milk. 
After 20 or a minute, they will give you like uh, fruit. After 20 minutes, they will take the trash. After two minutes, they will give you the, the actual uh, clamshell of the uh, of the food. And it, it just like, it's the, 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 the point is to, to keep you disoriented and to keep you like unstable and, 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 and settle in at that place. Uh, and yet, despite all that was taken from you, all of the different ways that they were trying to unsettle you, you still managed to find ways to resist, which is also, I think, one of the most interesting and moving parts of the book. Could you tell us the story of the protest you helped to organize to get dental dental treatment for a detainee named Zakaria, um, who had a tooth that had been broken during a beating? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I remember when Zakaria arrived the first time I was in solitary confinement, no fun but a block. <laughs> He was so afraid and scared. And, you know, before they even brought him to the blocks, people end up like trip to Guantanamo would take up to 40 or 50 hours beating and so on. It was, you know, part of it to prepare them for the interrogation. When they arrived at Guantanamo, there was, they, they, there was some of they call process station, uh, process station where people get stripped naked. They get like, um, searching the worst way and beating, and they will wait for line in hours and hours and hours. Then they will be also taken to a cold room, interrogation room, at the time like naked. Then they're, they're, the interrogators would come to interrogate you. People don't know what they were saying. So any, you have to answer the way they want you to, the, to these questions, basically. So when Zachariah arrived at the November block, I tried to talk to him. He was afraid because he didn't know who was there or who was the kind of person. Later on, in 2004, he got dental issue because he was beating badly and they broke some of his teeth on his way to Guantanamo. He spent the first day, the first day, the second, the third, about trying to, to talk to come administration about we need to treat our brothers. He cannot eat, he's, he cannot sleep, he is screaming of pain. And this is the way how we start. We first, we try to talk to someone, we try to find someone who can listen to us because we knew you cannot solve the problem with violence or going crazy. You try always try because you are a prisoner and you try to find someone who has like a sense of humanity in his heart that might understand and so on. And, and it's the way it is the way it is. It's like, we are just human beings. But we found we couldn't. I mean, no one wanted to listen to us. So we, I mean, you cannot watch someone. And basically, I couldn't. I said, I'm not going to keep watching my brothers like that. We have to do something. First of all, we, we started refusing to take our meals, you know, because treat our brother. I mean, it's peaceful protest. And it's just a message. They don't care. They were laughing at us. So then we went to the second phase. I mean, then we start like also protesting, uh, refusing to go to our, uh, out of our cells or search or appointment. Then we start sometimes throw milk or water at the guards and so on. So it's the way it is, you know, that the way they treated us, they wanted to extract the worst of us. They want also to keep fighting with the guards. You know, part of the treatment is not a big deal for them to treat, to treat when detainee, but also at the same time, interrogators. While he is in pain, interrogators used to call him, cooperate with us, give us some information answer this question, identify this bill on the, on the photos, give me something to give you something. So basically you have to pay and the pay with the information that again, one of the cases they have, some of the uh, detainees, they couldn't resist, you know, they, they break, they give them false information. They lied over and over again. I remember one of the detainees, he lied about three, over 300 prisoners at Guantanamo. He went against them. Many of us were tortured because his accounts. So, like sometime we started in the protest, you know, gradual, try to have peaceful protest, try to reason with, with the people, but it's not gonna end up unless it is like you and you end up fighting most of the time. All right, I'm gonna read a little section about Zakaria now during this period of time. Guards came for Zakaria early in the morning. Every brother who'd splashed guards was put on food punishment, no milk and no cups for a long time. We didn't mind, Zakaria was getting treated. We all sang to him in celebration when he came back. He smiled big, but his mouth was full of gauze. He couldn't talk yet because of the anesthesia and just went straight to sleep. I think it was the first time he slept in a week. I watched him sleep and studied his mouth. Why would his mouth be so full of gauze to fix one broken tooth? He had a lot of blood still coming out of his mouth. 
the corpsman came to give um, Zakaria the, a painkiller. Now, I cried, why wouldn't you bring him painkillers before when he really needed them? You know, I have my orders, the corpsman said. It wasn't bad like some of the guards. We understood that. He had his orders. The corpsman took the bloody gauze from Zakaria's mouth and filled it again with new gauze. After the third prayer, Zakaria was awake. The anesthesia had worn off and he, so, and he could talk. I don't know where they took me, he said. They hooded, and covered my ear, hooded me and covered my ears. He said he waited there for a long time before a doctor came with a bad Arabic interpreter. The doctor looked at his tooth and said he had a cavity and bad teeth. But the doctor wasn't a dentist and the cap didn't have one, so he couldn't, camp didn't have one, so he couldn't do a filling. The only thing he could do was extract the tooth. He told Zakaria to ask his interrogator to be taken to the base hospital, but since Zakaria had stopped talking to interrogators, they wouldn't help him. The doctor spent a long time working on my mouth, Zakaria said, and he kept giving me shots. Show me your mouth, I said. Zakaria opened his mouth and I almost threw up. There were bloody holes everywhere. Are you crazy, I cried. He closed his mouth. Keep it open. I was really angry. Do you know how many teeth they extracted? Just the one, he asked. Your mouth looks like the doctor threw a hand grenade in there, I said. Stop joking, Zakaria was really scared. Now, this isn't funny. This is real, brother, I said. I'm serious. Zakaria turned to uh, Gamden, his neighbor on the, on the other side of the cage, and opened his mouth again. This is madness, Gamden cried. How could you let this happen? What are you talking about? Zakaria cried. Criminals, Gamden. Gamden was really mad too. Where are your teeth? I cried. Didn't the doctor show you? My mouth is classified, Zakaria said. The doctor told me that if I wanted to see, I had to ask my interrogator. I couldn't hold back my tears. I was afraid that they could do this to any one of us. I called the camp officer and an interpreter. Guess how many teeth that asshole criminal extracted from Zakaria's mouth? Two, you might guess, no. Three, no. Please go on. Five, six, no. Are you crazy, Mansoor? They took eight teeth at one time. The descriptions of the ways that you and your fellow detainees were treated are in every way shocking and appalling. But I was also really moved by the ways that you and others were able to negotiate and fight for, if not right, then clear rules. And for our listeners, I'm putting air quotes around that with your jailers. Could you talk to us about how conditions changed during your time at Guantanamo? You know, the situation we call, I call in my book, the dark age with between 2002 and 2010, where, you know, enhanced interrogation technique took place, hunger strike, beating, I mean, you name it. They brought the army, they brought the air force, they brought the marines, they brought the navy, they brought, they, it turned to be, as I told you, an experimenting and training facility for uh, soldiers, for interrogator, for uh, interrogator, for psychologists and so on. We had hope at the beginning when we heard there's an uh, American African uh, president who was going to, or black guy who was going to close the detention. And we all wished that he would win and close the detention eventually. But in 2009, many of us were on hunger strike and force feeding. Myself, I spent around like three years on force feeding. Some of us five, some of the brothers 10. Some of them still until that for 15 years in force feeding, and that also classified. So in 2009, when Obama won the, the election, the administration, they said, okay, what do you guys hunger strike for? You are, leaving, you are leaving in one year. He said, no, we don't. if we learn something here, not to trust you guys. And after three or four months talking to those, the same leadership, like I told him, have you received any uh, orders or instruction to prepare for leaving people living in Guantanamo? They said, no. I said, it's not going to close that place because if you want to close that place in one year, there is, we could, you could see some preparation, you could see some movement, there was nothing. And because Guantanamo is our place, <laughs> we are very experienced in Guantanamo. So we told the brother, we're not going to stop the hunger strike unless we're going to negotiate about the about conditions. Obama sent some kind of uh, delegation to come to visit Guantanamo. And when I met them, their first question, uh, they asked me, why are you wearing the orange jumpsuit? Why are you on hunger strike? Why are you causing problems? And I said, that shocked me. I said, are you serious? You brought me to that place. You torture me, you beat me, you kill me in that place. And you tell me why I'm like that? And 
I, I thought I'm going to meet some some kind of like civilian. They were civilians, but what the administration told them about, uh, they just believe it. They took it for granted. They said this guy's a, uh, is a bad guy. He's causing problems. He's in orange jumpsuit. He's in hunger strike. He's doing all this kind of stuff. I said, of course, I, I do whatever I can because this this is how they treat us. Anyway, I mean. <clears throat> In their eyes, we were just, you know, detainees or prisoners. You're just always a terrorist. I didn't know how they think of us. But I told them about our life there. That delegation made some recommendation when they found Guantanamo wasn't going to wasn't going to close Guantanamo. They want to make it like a little good, you know. So we start negotiating with the current administration about our life and the detention. We consulted our brothers. What do you want? Do you want to continue uh, the fight and join us? And there was a lot of people who want to join us because they said, no, we are so tired and we need to, to wait and see what's going to happen. And, you know, we have to listen to our brothers. And everyone honestly was so tired. Everyone was sick. Everyone, you know, after seven or eight years in solitary confinement. I said, we said, okay, we initiate with the current administration about, you know, about everything, about improving the, stopping the torture, stopping the interrogation. You know, uh, family uh, communication, uh, community living, news, uh, classes. Uh, uh, also, uh, you know, we set some kind of rules about the life in, in, in Guantanamo. At the beginning, they were hesitant about it, but there were also the recommendation from the White House, they should do some improvement. We took our advantage and I think we get 90% of our uh, demands. This how things change at Guantanamo, we call it the golden age. And they hated the military. Actually, hated so much seeing us sitting on this table and, you know, asking them to be treated like humans. And that wasn't too much for them to be treated like human. I said, guys, we are human beings. And we asked them about our case. Should be something should be done. Our work in our case. They said, look, we are not. We cannot talk about that. We are here to talk about your life in the detention. I said, okay, this is what needs to be done. An American. <laughs> In America, really smart. When they want to calm you down, they brought nice people. They brought nice uh, calm administration. They brought nice guards. And we spent like 2010, uh, 11, and 12, I call the golden age. But in 2013, everything was, again, changed in even worse than the first days. Why was that, do you think? <clears throat> you know, when the army, again, uh, at that time, the camp was under the Navy control. They were nicer than the army. But when the <laughs> army came, yeah, when the army took over in 2012. That's generally them, thought to be true, and, and, and weirdly enough, people know that about the Navy, that they're nicer than the army. I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I mean, like, when the army came in 2012, they weren't happy up to see us, like, have some kind of little freedom. I told you. They, start, they started, you know taking a stop, they started making things, tightening the rules, changing the rules. And they, they thought, they said, your guy have more pride than the president of the United States. And when you, when you talk to them about, what are you talking about? So that's time 2010. But it was a scary situation because we didn't know what's going to happen to us and until when. So, and we knew something is going to happen. And I told my brothers, look, now let us lie to ourselves, something is going to happen, but we need to do something. So the army, the army came, they said they need to shut down the communal living and to reopen it again because they said you, your guys in control. So in 2013, they cracked down, they devastated everything, they confiscated everything. And again, we respond with the hunger strike. You know, we lost everything at that time, but we, we win. At that time, like, and I told my brother, in order to win, sometimes you have to lose everything. And they made a mistake before when we were a hunger strike, they would separate us in different camps, in different blocks, hide us in somewhere. But at that time, they would make a mistake. We were all most like 90% of the prisoners were in camp six. So, and we also the red line, we said this time, we're not going to be in the front, we're going to be in the back because we need to everyone to react. It's time. So, the, our brother were expecting us to. As usual, we said, no, we're going to this time. It's a mistake. So, alhamdulillah, it was almost like 100% of camp six were on, on hunger strike, except two brothers, they could old age. And it was one of the most successful hunger strike. It led to Obama that announced he's going to close detention again, but he didn't. 
then they started the delegation started came to Guantanamo to meet from different countries to meet with the brothers. Then when they started the PRPs was like a periodic review board to review the cases. And we started seeing some brother uh, get released. So um, some past US presidents, as, you, as you've been mentioning, have openly stated their intentions to close Guantanamo Bay and some not all because obviously Bush and Trump notably did not want to close it. And as you mentioned, Obama said he wanted to close it and, and didn't. And there are still roughly 40 prisoners there. Um, and you are currently working with CAGE, which is an independent advocacy organization working to empower communities impacted by the war on terror. And early in 2021, you and several other former Guantanamo detainees, including folks affiliated with CAGE, um, published an open letter to President Biden in the New York Review of Books calling on him to close the prison and outlining specific steps, um, this eight point plan to make that possible and to facilitate, for example, safe resettlement for detainees, um, repatriation or resettlement in, in, a, in a country that would be safe for them. And um, so we'll link to that uh, open letter in our show notes. President Biden has said that he intends to close the prison by the end of his term in office. And I wonder if you think he will. You know, we have been fighting for the last 20 years for the, course, for the closure of uh, Guantanamo and for justice to be uh, applied to Guantanamo. And as you see, it's like four administrations and still still open, it's like around uh, 38 ministers around at Guantanamo. Only two uh, men have been released since Biden took, uh, uh, when the election in 2020. Uh, as you mentioned that we wrote a letter to President Biden asking him to close detention. It's like a roadmap to close, uh, to close Guantanamo based on our experience, observation, and so on. And also last year, I finished my uh, bachelor degree. My degree what was about rehabilitation and reintegration of former Guantanamo detainees into social life and labor market. Since I got out, I get out from Guantanamo, I have been fighting for the closure of Guantanamo, fighting for the brothers in Guantanamo and outside of uh, Guantanamo. You know, closing Guantanamo, <laughs> Is more right and it's the best interest of the United States because it should, that place shouldn't exist in the first uh, place. And it's one of the biggest human rights violations violation in the 21st century. And I could see many Americans, many organizations, many lawyers calling for the closure of uh, Guantanamo. The war ended in Afghanistan, you know, and Guantanamo still happened, still, uh, still open. And until when? Like, until when is they are going to keep it open? Like, when you talk about I'm just I'm talking just about the money that's spent about going to was around like half billion every year. And only 38 men, uh, around like 20 of them have been approved for least. Only 18. Two of them, like uh, one of them actually convicted, or two of them actually now. It, when we talk to the lawyer about Guantanamo case, it's like going in a loop. Because as we said speak, speak before, it's it's like to the uh, basic for uh, justice. So the government keeps change the rules over and over again when they come to trials or military commissions and, and so on. So we wrote a letter that we just, anyone who uh, charged or tried, they should be committing a crime, they should be charged and tried before American justice system, you know? And you know, the problem they said they don't want to bring anyone to United States. Okay, you can sentence them and send them to some countries close to, to their countries to spend the, their time or to uh, countries close to their uh, countries. You know, basically, because one of the main issues they said if you close Guantanamo, where we are going to detain those uh, prisoners. And again, uh, you want to charge them, you want to try them, but you don't want to uh, imprison them in your, in, in your country. You know, it, it is just crazy. It's upside down world. They want to, if, if you can call it justice, because as you know, the CIA torture, everyone destroyed the evidence and it's, it is, it is an upside down world. So, but I hope, I hope, I mean, we hope that by the end of his term, the Guantanamo will be closed and this chapter will be closed for forever. We're about to sign off with you, but I wanted to ask you just a personal question. Um, it's 14 years you were there, is that right? Am I remembering the number right? Uh, yeah. around, around 15 years. Okay. <laughs> How do you mentally come to terms with the loss of that much of your life in a place being in prison for a thing that you did not do? Uh, to answer that question, 
You know, at Guantanamo, I had determined that I will never let Guantanamo change me anyway. Guantanamo part of my life. Guantanamo shaped my everything, shaped my myself, my character, my almost because you cannot deny 15 years or in your life in that place. But at the same time, I try to stick to who I am, who I, as a person, as a human, and not to let Guantanamo change me in any way. And I, I take it as a duty to close Guantanamo and to fight the idea of, uh, of uh, Guantanamo because Guantanamo, as I told you, stand for you know, injustice, oppression, torture, lawlessness, abuse of power, indefinite detention. So we are fighting the idea of, of uh, Guantanamo. But I can tell you there is, we have, a pro we have some lasting effect is going to take some time. And some of the scars, I didn't think it will ever heal because it's like, I feel there is a 15 years gap in my life. And uh, still there's a lot of change in that world. And still we live, life after Guantanamo, we live in the stigma of uh, Guantanamo. Guantanamo hasn't left us yet. We still live being in Guantanamo, being like use of tourism, even from the, the hosting countries, you know, being denied to get married, hard to get married, not able to find a job or denied basic services. Like, for example, I tried to send money to my family through Western Union. I was just, this is the last, this, this week. And the Western Union said, no, you cannot send, my, you cannot use our service simply because you are in Guantanamo. Yes, mm -hmm. it's that. So it is something, you know, living life after Guantanamo still hard and difficult and we try to manage. Ansar, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and listeners, we encourage you yeah, to- I would like to say, yeah. Oh, would, please. Sorry, I would like to say just one last word to the American people and uh, especially to President Biden. Please close uh, Guantanamo. Please stop the, uh, uh, the indefinite uh, detention. Stop the torture. Stop the abuse of power that had been, that also abuse of American justice system till that day. Thank you. Um, yeah, the word that you keep using that is sticking in my head is lawlessness. Um, because despite sort of the pretense to accountability and justice, it seems it's like a totally lawless place. Um, and we appreciate so much your joining us and talking to us about this. And listeners, we encourage you to order and read Munster's Searing Memoir, Don't Forget Us Here, Lost and Found at Guantanamo and tell your congressperson that you don't want any more anniversaries for the Guantanamo Bay prison.